I don't know if it, um, hey Connor, can you tap my can you tap my my volume level down? Does anybody hear me echoing, or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. I hear myself too much. That's kind of scary. Um, hearing too much of me. Um, and so what I'm going to do this morning, you know, two weeks ago we started. Um, well, we're not really a start. We just took a pause from our study through the book of Colossians, um, and we talked about having a hunger and a thirst for God. And so I. Picked this, this graphic, this picture here, and we talked a little bit about that a couple weeks ago. Um, we're going to finish up uh, that part. We left off with, um, there's three things I wanted to talk about, what hinders our life, or what can hinder us from having a deeper walk with the Lord, and I want to look at that third point, and then we'll get back with Colossians uh, chapter 3 um, next Sunday. You remember why I picked that picture? Most everything I do is very deliberate. <laughs> Empty bowl. I doubt that person's worshiping God. I doubt the person's hungry. I mean, she's probably just hungry for something, maybe some oatmeal or whatever. I don't know what. The reason why I picked that picture is because you, you sense a, a, there's a hunger there. There's a, there's a desire there in those hands. Um, but the reason why I picked it was because the bowl has been emptied and cleaned. And that's how we have to come before God. If we're going to have a true hunger and thirst for him, we have to kind of empty our lives. Um, sanct- out of the sanctification and cleansing of a life, presenting to God a useful vessel a clean vessel that's good for the master. And so that's why I, I picked that. And so I want to start this talk out this morning, this discussion this morning, from a devotional, the devotion I read uh, this past week that really spoke to my heart and just really kind of was clarifying some things that I was thinking about as we finish up this talk this morning on being, having a hunger and thirst for God. But it's a devotion that uh, David Wilkerson, some of you guys know Pastor David Wilkerson, he died in 2011, but pastor of Times Square Church, did a lot of ministry in New York City. He's the cross and the switchblade guy. If you remember that book that he wrote was made into a movie by Eric, I think Eric Estrada and Chris Christopherson played in it. God's used David Wilkerson in a powerful way. Many believe a prophet during our time, a voice piece of God. But I love this uh, devotion that he wrote at some point in his life, but it was shared just this past week, talking about beautiful rest in my Lord is the title of the devotion. It's going to I think it would be a good catalyst as we go into talking about having a hunger and thirst for God. But Wilkerson, uh, pulling from Psalm 16, chapter 16, and verse 11, it says, In your presence is fullness, is fullness of joy. <clears throat> At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Wilkerson says this. <clears throat> he says, Christians are growing further dissatisfied with the way things are in the world. Who can say amen to that? <laughs> and in the church. And in the church. These saints are saying... God has something more for us. He is calling us to know him better, and we want to walk in obedience to that call. They are beginning to fast to fast and pray in their quest for more spiritual depth. What he's basically saying is they're, they're longing to know God. They're hungry for God, a deeper walk with the Lord. This generation is becoming wicked and vile because it is losing its faith in God, and that faith is dissipating because the Bible is no longer consumed as a life-giving force. Do not blame the devil. Our backslidings are the result of one thing, lack of prayer and Bible reading. Jesus will not abide in a temple that ignores him, neglects him. When the Lord wants to touch you supernaturally, he will stir your nest. An inexplicable divine restlessness will come upon you, and you will become disinterested in much of what you have been doing in life. All your accomplishments will leave you feeling empty and unfulfilled, and you will sense a deep, unmet need in your spirit. The mark of this supernatural dealing is a hungry heart. Every waking your, your hour, your heart will reach out to him, and his thoughts will always be on your mind. God wants you to turn loose of the things of this world and find your completeness in him. Is your soul hungry for more of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you sense his call to a deeper walk with God? If, you, if so, end the war inside your heart by yielding everything to the master. You can know true peace and happiness the moment you quit striving to acquire greater success or more things to satisfy your ego. Seek nothing but Jesus, and your life will take on new meaning. Anxiety will be gone, worldly ambition will die, and your spiritual eyes will be opened to truth. When the Holy Spirit gives you revelation knowledge, you will experience true riches in Christ Jesus. You will awaken each morning with overflowing joy, and your soul will cry out, I have found what my soul has been longing for, 
rest, beautiful rest in my Lord. We need to be praying, O oh God, cause me to see how cold I have become. Cause me to know how weak I am and put in me a new hunger for spiritual things. I mean, isn't that the call? I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I know talking to some of you that you sense that in your lives. Something's off in the world. <laughs> Something's even off in the church. <clears throat> As I was thinking about that and just reading through God's Word this week and spending time in prayer, the sense that I got as the Lord was showing me some things is that, that when you feel that longing or that hunger, that thirst inside you, it's actually God's hand touching you. It's God's hand drawing you to himself. It's a, it's a super, really a supernatural thing that he's doing. And when you sense that, you know that the things of this world, what Wilkerson was saying, it can't really, it does, they're just, they, they're not, they lose taste. There's no hope in them. They're, they, they're fleeting. It's like, you know, what uh, King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. It's all vanity. It's meaningless. It, you know, and as he evaluates his life, as he gets to the end of his life, he's like, you know, at the end of my life, I, you know, I've done it all. I've had it all, tried it all, been wealthy, you know, had all this prosperity, you know, great power and all this. And he's like, boy, I, by the time I get to the end of my life, he said, the one thing that only matters is, is to obey God, to fear him, to be obedient to his word. And, and so you sense that hunger, but unfortunately, King Solomon even tasted some of the things of the world and found that they were absolutely useless. <clears throat> so that's what we are going to talk about. You know, do we have a hunger and thirst for God? And so two weeks ago, uh, we started this discussion. Um, the question that was asked was simply, it'll be on the screen, he said, what gets in the way of a deeper walk with God in your life? What, what hinders that, that, that deeper understanding of who Christ is, that deeper walk, that just kind of walking with him 24-7, 365, it's just that growing in that the deeper things of the Lord, as Wilkerson talks about, a renewed, having a renewed mind, a, a greater interest in, uh, in the things of the Lord. And so, just by way of review, I don't want to spend much time on them. Two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the first two of these three things that I just kind of came up with, and... The first one was, <clears throat> the things that gets in the way sometimes is ministry or religious activity. Remember that? How can ministry or Christian religious activity get in the way of having a deeper hunger or thirst for God, or maybe even a deeper walk with Him? Have you ever experienced it? Yeah, I just do children's ministry because they need somebody in there. Don't really care about the kids that much. You know, they got material. I'll figure the material out when I get there. I just, you know, I'm doing something. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a double thing because, one, it's any activity that's apart from pursuing God, pursuing progressive sanctification is bad. But you lay on top of it, we, we are self-righteous because we came and we did. And thinking that, you know, God's going to bless me for that or I'm doing God a favor and follow where I'm going. It's a, it's a double, you know, if you're just sitting watching TV, that's bad. But if you're coming and you're serving and you're doing all of those things, but you don't have a relationship with Christ, it's double bad because you're fooling yourself on two levels. Yeah, the ministry and religious activity can be very deceptive. Can be very deceptive, and I'm not saying I'm not saying getting don't no don't get out of it. You know, um, if God's leading you into something like that, that's awesome. But um, what happens is, and remember, we looked at the church. What remember what church we looked at? I can say all kinds of things here on Sunday morning. It'd be my opinion, but if they're not backed by the Bible, I mean, my, that's just my opinion. Remember the church in Ephesus, Revelation two. I mean, we looked at one through five, but one through seven is the entire church that Jesus addresses the church that was in Ephesus. You know, and out of all of those churches, those seven churches that he talks to in Revelation 2 and 3, the church in Ephesus and the church of, um, I guess, the church of Laodicea are the only two that you really hear anything else about in the Bible. Now, the church of Thyatira that he, that he talks about in there, I mean, I don't, Lydia, if you remember the story in Acts 16, Lydia, the traitor of purple, she was from the town of Thyatira. Now, I don't know that she went back to Thyatira, Thyatira and planted a church, I think. She may have said in Philippi, I don't know. But the church in Ephesus is spoke about a lot in the Bible. Acts 19, Paul spent three years in Ephesus. A lot of folks were engaged in Ephesus. Paul, I mean, Timothy became a pastor of the church in Ephesus. 
Priscilla, I mean, th th there's just a lot of folks who were in there. That was a powerhouse of the church. And the word of the Lord went out from them, Acts 19 tells us, into all of Asia Minor, and churches were planted off that church. And then we have the letter of Ephesians, a great letter of Ephesians that Paul wrote to that church. And then after he writes that letter, a couple decades later, Jesus has another letter to give to him. Just think about that. It only took, what, maybe 30 years? 30 years, and the church was still doing ministry. Jesus noticed some really great things that they were doing when he addressed them in Revelation 2. I know thy works. I know what you're doing. You're testing those who claim to be apostles and are not. You're persevering. You're laboring for my namesake. You're doing all these great things that you, that you should be doing. But remember the, remember the nevertheless statement, verse 4 of Revelation 2? Nevertheless. Doesn't that just cut everything else out? It's not, you know, I can sit there and say, hey, rich man, and just build you up. But then here it comes, nevertheless, rich. You're just like, man. First part, what, what, it's meaningless. That's why he says, nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. He says, repent of that. Go back to those first works. He says, repent of it. And if you won't, he says, I'm going to come. And basically what he says is, I'm going to remove your witness. You're not going to be at church for me no more. Because of this, because I'm no longer the head. I'm no lo and we've been studying this in Colossians 1 and 2. The head of the church is Christ. They left him. They were doing all kinds of ministries, like what Rebecca said. They were just going through the motions. Jesus wasn't their focus. So religious activity and ministry can get in the way. We use also the example in Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42. Remember that? Remember who those who we talked about? Mary and Martha, the sisters. And it's just an example that I use. What was Martha busy doing? Cooking, serving, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just letting, there's nothing wrong. But she was in the kitchen serving, and Jesus, her Creator, sitting in the other room, and the other guests were there, and his, her sister Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet, just soaking in Christ, getting to know Jesus, spending time with the Lord. And Martha gets upset and comes and says, "Lord, can't you make her help me? Look at all the stuff that I'm doing." What did Jesus say to Martha? Mar, you got uh, this Bible, Martha, Martha. You're distracted and worried about so much. I'm not going to take from Mary what she's found, because she's found the better part. See, there's nothing wrong with serving in the kitchen. There's nothing wrong with serving in children's ministry. There's nothing wrong with whatever. But if you don't ever spend any time at Jesus' feet, it all just becomes a self-righteous, I'm just trying to do, and you almost fall into, and I'm not saying you're going to be those people, but the Matthew 7 people, that all they can talk about is their works. Well, Lord, look what we did for you. And Jesus is like, wait a second, I've never known you. You, didn't, I wasn't, you weren't authorized to do that. We never had a, an abiding relationship. So sometimes religious activity or ministry, Christian ministry, can get in the way or even choke out a relationship with the Lord or a greater hunger and thirst for him. The second thing we talked about, um, which I think is going to go hand in hand with this third point that we're going to look at this morning, that we call, I call it stuff, comfort, and self. How can stuff, comfort, and self hinder your walk with the Lord or dampen maybe a hunger or thirst that you should develop for him in a greater way. Doing what? <clears throat> As Rich says, spending your, staying busy, spending your wheels, doing nothing, accomplishing nothing, storing up nothing in heaven. Everything you're storing up here is where the moth and rust can destroy, where the thief can break in and steal, Jesus talks about. He says, because where your heart is, I mean, where your treasure is, where you're storing, that's where your heart's going to be. That's what, I mean, can't, can't trying to seek the comforts of this world distract you from a deeper relationship with the Lord? That's the, I think that's one of the greatest, actually some other, some other readings I was doing with David Wilkerson, some devotionals he was, that, his, that ministry was putting out from him this week. <clears throat> he was talking about another one, which I don't know if it has a lot to do with this, but he was talking about spiritual warfare. And he said the churches in other countries, and he was referencing like places like we mentioned, China and Iran and Somalia and North Korea, these places where it's illegal to be a Christian. Um, they're, they're just being just attacked right into their faces. You know, being actually killed, being arrested. They've got to go underground. And there, there's a war going on. But Wilkerson said there's a war in America going on, but the enemy's more subtle. And he's using the comforts of our land, the things that we pursue in our, in our country, self, our, you know, it's always about self, to distract us. Isn't that almost sometimes, I, I think sometimes could be a greater enemy than, than downright persecution, just all, all out. Because what's happening to the, the church in Iran right now? <clears throat> if you've read any, anything, it's growing. That's the best way to put it. Rick said it. The church in Iran is reported right now. It's growing like crazy.
crazy. They say, actually, I've heard terms like, it's bursting at the seams. Who knows what it's like to be a Christian in Iran? We wouldn't be doing this openly. I could guarantee you that, unless you've just got a death wish. There's nothing wrong. If God calls you to that, that's, that's your ministry. Yeah, you could be killed for being a Christian in that country, arrested. You're a second-class citizen. They hide. But underneath all that, this church is just expanding. It's growing numerically, but it's also growing spiritually. So what, and in my mind, I'm like, well, wait, that don't make no sense. We have all these great freedoms here. We have the ability to do all this and that. And why, why aren't we growing like that numerically and spiritually? Comfort, self. Remember when we brought up the church there in Revelation chapter 3? you remember what church we talked about, verses 14 through 20? The last church, yeah, Megan got it, Laodicea, the church of Laodicea. Here's a church that Jesus, at least, the other churches, he at least commends them for some, something they were doing right. All of them, even the dead church of Sardis, were doing some things right. This church, he doesn't mention a single thing that they're doing right. And when you read the whole thing about the church, Jesus was on the outside of this church. He wasn't even inside them no more. Wasn't there? And he says, you say, and they're making all these statements, look, I'm rich, I don't need nothing, look at us, we're just prospering, we got everything going on, Lord. Listen, if something goes crazy, I'll, we'll call on you. But we got it down, our, we, it's our ways of doing things, it's all this. And Jesus is like, you don't even know how wretched you are, blind and naked. But he still loved them. He said, because those whom I love, I what? Rebuke and chasten. He says, therefore, be zealous and repent. He still loved this church that was identifying at some level of being a Christians or whatever, but they weren't. They had no love for Christ at all. So this, this idea of comfort and self, it's all about me. I can, do, I can pull church off. I can do it in my own power. But the sad thing is when we do that, we end up reproducing folks after our kind, not after Christ. That's one of the dangers of that. You know, matter of fact, this idea of self or comfort is one of the main characteristics of the generation that's going to be living in the last days, 2 Timothy 3. But Paul says to Timothy, know this, Timothy, that in the last times, perilous days will come. Difficult times will come. And so you think that he's going to say, you know, there's going to be a lack of food or, or housing or jobs or, you know, just that persecution, but he doesn't say that. He says, in the last times, it's going to be this, love of self, love of money, pursuit of more idolatry, no interest in the things of God. But they'll have a form of godliness. They're going to look Christian outwardly. They look Christian, Paul says Timothy, there in that 2 Timothy 3 section. He's like, but they have no power. And he says, from such people, don't have nothing to do with them. Turn away from them. It's a characteristic of the last days. And so these two things, religious activity, <clears throat> and then a love of self and comfort, will actually distract us and it causes us not to have a hunger and thirst for God. And like I said, the third one that we're going to talk about <clears throat> this morning is, is a huge one because it really goes, I think, with the other two. This is really the root cause, of the cause. but it's going to be, we're going to talk about sin this morning. <clears throat> When's the last church service or church you've ever been in when anybody's ever talked about that fun topic? Or even hell. <laughs> you don't find it much in church today. Sin. I actually did a, a quick study, and I just used Blue Letter Bible, that resource. I typed in words, sin, sinneth, or sins. Guess how many times <clears throat> that word appears in the Bible? I, I just stopped counting. It was just, I was like, good night. Like, I couldn't click the uh, tabs enough where it's found. It starts in Genesis 4 and ends in 1 John 5, I think around 17 or 18, depending on how the translator is translated. But from Genesis 4 to 1 John 5, sin, sins, or sinneth, or offshoots of that, iniquity, transgressions, I mean, you hear it all, all through the Bible, it talks about sin, it talks about sin. Actually, the first mention of the word sin is in Genesis chapter 4, where God is talking to Cain, it's talking about how sin lies at your door, ready to get you, be careful against it. And then at the very last time, or the last time that it's mentioned in 1 John 5, 17 or 18, it's in both verses, but it might be translated differently, um, it talks about how, John talks about how the child of God will not practice it. So here it is lying at the door, and all the way 66 books later, or not quite 66, 60 something, 62, 63 books later, that it's something that we're not to practice sin, unrepentant sin. But so what I'm going to talk about this morning is, is the, the unrepentant side of sin. The unrepentant side of sin. So <clears throat> sin in the life of an unbeliever, what's that do for him? Sin in the life of an unbeliever. (laughs) 
So Mike's quoting places in Romans and other places in the Bible. That an unbeliever who is in sin is en route to hell. They have no covering. They have no propitiation. They're storing up wrath, for, as he says, to the day of wrath. They're just continuing. They have no knowledge of God. They're in their sin. They're dead to their sin. I mean, just read Ephesians 2, the first couple of verses. Paul talks about what it looks like. Now, who's referencing the church? They used to be like this. So in the life of the unbeliever, sin is, going, sin is what's going to... They're separated from God. They're en route to hell. They have no propitiation. They have nobody to pay for their sin but themselves. What about the sin in the life of a believer? Is there such a thing? Sin in the life of a true child of God. What's that? You shouldn't be practicing it. But do you still sin? We all should be going, yep, <laughs> every day. I still, I still do it. The difference between sin in the life of an unbeliever and the sin in the life of the believer, the sin in the life of the believer is that you hate it, should hate it. It causes, it should cause, it's going to cause me pain. If, depending on the sin, it could cause my wife pain or my kids pain. It could cause the witness of, I mean, just all, it causes all kinds of pain. And I should absolutely hate it. But now I've been given all the resources that I need to battle it. The life of an unbeliever, it causes them nothing. Like, I can remember back in the day when I was doing all kinds of stuff. And I've used the stories, you know, I had, used to have a horrible problem with alcohol. I'd get drunk and, you know, and, and I just felt bad either because I got caught or just I looked like a fool or whatever. It wasn't because I felt like I, I grieved God. But as, as now as the life of a believer, I, I know that this sin is, is grie it's grievous. It's a battle. And we have victory over sin. We've been forgiven of it. It no longer clings to us. It no longer, uh, it no longer should have that kind of an influence over us. We no longer are going to have to pay the, for the penalty of sin, which we know is death, Romans says. But it's still, good. It's still in our life. And as we walk day by day... We should, have, we, should, we should basically conquer it through the, through the help of the Holy Spirit and His guiding. But the, what I'm going to talk about is the sin in the life of a believer. There's two things that's going to happen when it happens in your life, especially gone unchecked or unrepented. As I study the Bible, and I, you probably, we probably could add a couple to this, there's two things that's going to happen in the, in the life of a child of God. Number one, your fellowship is going to be broke. I didn't say your relationship. But your, a fellowship with God is going to be hindered. And the second thing that happens is that you forfeit blessings, God's blessings on you, the things that he might want to give you and to bless you and however, however he might use you. And so when I say that you kind of forfeit this idea of a fellowship with him, you know, as I was thinking as, of an example, I was thinking about, you know, me and Trace. Like me and Trace, you married. We've married almost 28 years. But if we're at odds with one another, if I, it's usually it's me, I've done something stupid or said something, and, and there's all of a sudden there's this unrest in the home. There's something off between me and her. We're not divorced. We're still married. We still have a relationship with one another, but there's something off. And how, do we, how, would, I, how would we correct this being off, this you know, I don't know if you've ever been, if you want to be honest in your marriage, have you ever just been in a place where you're just like, you you know, the, the quickest way to get to the garage is to go to the kitchen, but she's in the kitchen, so I have to like, is that just reality? Have you, who, I mean, am I the only one that's ever done it? Well, I'm standing by the front door and she has to leave, but she goes out to the garage and takes the long way around to get to her car, because just by passing by me is just going to cause problems. You, you get what I'm saying? That's the same thing with your, our relationship with the Lord. We're still married. We're not going anywhere. Our marriage, but the relationship's off. And what is going to correct that offness between me and her? What's that? Prayer for one. Obviously, I, was, I mean, yeah, I got to repent. Like it's probably me. I got to repent of something dumb I did. Maybe whatever. And we got to talk. We got to. There's forgiveness. We got to. For, there's going to be forgiveness there. You know, and usually that's how it happens. It happen, I mean, the longer we get married, the shorter those times, you know, before it would be like, what, it would be like three or four days. I, I was, you wouldn't even talk to one another. It's, just, it's stupid. Like, I'm just telling this for you young guys or young girls going to get married. You know, get to, the, get to that maturity quick because it will just save you. But over the years, those times have got, you know, <laughs> less and less to where forgiveness comes in quicker. What I'm getting at is, even in the life of a believer, a relationship with the Lord, now, that marriage, so to speak, or this, 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 our relationship with him isn't, isn't cut, but the fellowship is. Who would agree with that? Have you ever just been in a season of sin, or whatever you want to call it, and you just feel like God's not close? 
Your prayers are dead. The Bible doesn't mean much. You know, it's like, man, it's, what, and he's not gone nowhere. What's he done to me? He's not done anything to me. It's me. It's me. And then, you know, and like what Wilkerson says, he begins to press in, and he begins to touch your life, and he begins to reveal things, and he points this out, he points that out. And it's the first John 1, 9, you confess your sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you, and to cleanse you. And if you want to read all of it, that's why this lady study of 1 John is going to be huge. Read 1 John 1, 1 through about 9, maybe into 10. It talks about fellowship with the Father. And that fellowship with the Father always comes by walking in the light, confessing your sins, claiming that you do, you know, if you claim you have sin, or you don't sin, you make God a liar. The truth's not in you. You're, you're not telling the truth. So we do sin. There's times we do that. And the time that the fellowship is off, with the Lord, this idea of having a hunger and thirst for God is probably because of sin in our life. So a picture that I, I put up there, I don't know if you haven't, I think I, what I say, uh, I don't remember the words I put up there. They're still, still attractive, still dangerous. Isn't, isn't sin at some level still attractive? Still attractive. We still live in these stinking bodies of flesh. It should be less attractive. How dangerous is sin? Deadly. Rick said it perfect. Sin's deadly. Read, read James 1. Once it births in your life, it creates death. Death. If we sow into the flesh, Galatians 6, all that comes is destruction. If we sow into the spirit, everlasting life. Because God says it's not going to be mocked. Why did I, I don't know if you can kind of, kind of say I doctored, I, I, actually I increased the I because sin is all about what? Me. It's all about I, Me. Grammar is probably not correct, but it's all about I. I why is sin idolatry? Really, that's just what it is. Yeah, that's all idolatry is. It's my way instead of God's way. I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to serve him my way. And when you look at the nation of Israel and Judah, mostly Judah, both, both of those tribes, but the kingdoms, I'm going to do, I'll, serve, I'll even serve God my way, even in the, re the religious parts of it. I'll do it the way I want to do it. I won't do it the way God wants to do it. It's all about me. It's that comfort self. I'll do religious activity and ministry my way. And so sin begins to creep in. It's, it's, an, it's an idol. So what I want to look at is this morning, is a Psalm, we're going to start in Psalm 66, verse 18. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, If I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear. <clears throat> What does that mean to regard iniquity or regard sin in my heart? What's that? Actually, that's exactly, Mike, I don't know if you read the word, the Hebrew word. That's actually what the Hebrew word uh, means. It means that I see it. I know it's there. But I what? I, remain, I don't do anything about it. I remain, that's what it means. I regard, I know that there's something, remember, where is, it, where is this sin located? Is it the outward actions, the flesh that's being... No, it's in here. See, outwardly, we could put on, like Rebecca says, I could put on the front. I do religious activity. I do ministry. I go through the motions. I'm a Pharisee. I look very religious. But what? Inwardly, I'm full of what? Dead man bones. I have a whitewashed appearance. But, but God looks at where? The heart. It's a heart. Ministry is all about the heart. So if I regard iniquity, if I look at it, I know it's in there, but I'm, I'm toying with maybe, you know, maybe mom and dad doesn't know, or my wife doesn't know, or my friend doesn't know, or Jim doesn't know, that I have an inward sin issue going on. I'm playing with something. I'm toying. So I regard it in here, but no one else sees it. The Lord sees it. He says, you know what? Stop your praying. Stop it. We need to deal with this first. God will always deal with the sin issue in your life long before he'll use you in any kind of ministry. Because remember, Paul says that, that we're to present ourselves as a what? A clean vessel useful for the master. That's that cup picture. I've been cleaned out. I'm emptied. You know, he's not going to use folks that are, that are just doing things in their lives, sin in their lives. God's going to deal with the, that person first and then the inside. Yeah, it's always a hard issue. It's all, faith is it's always a hard issue. If you confess with your mouth, Romans, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, <laughs> heart, you'll be saved. It's, the, it's a heart. There's a confession with the mouth and there's a heart issue that we don't regard iniquity. We don't play with things that are in our heart because God sees those things. 
And he's, what is he waiting for, simply? Confession and repentance, that's it. Confession, I'm, I, listen, I, confession, all confession is, is agreeing with the Lord. That's what that word means, To I agree with you, God, that this is sin. I agree. And now is repentance. Actually, I think we were talking with a couple folks. There's sometimes, I think someone said, sometimes we need to repent of our repentance. What does that mean? Sometimes we need to repent of our repentance. Yeah, get real. Come on. Like, yeah, that's what it means. It's like, you know what? I, I'm re- repenting. All it means is turning, turning my mind's eye, mind, my life. I'm turning away from something. And sometimes we need to even repent of that because we're not actually turning. We're just like, we, we're trying to, but we're still, it's like, you know, it's, what is it? Uh, um, I'm trying to think, Luke 17. It's, uh, I'm lost here. Lot's wife. Where's her heart? Remember what Jesus said? It's a short verse. Remember Lot's wife. That's a, there's a verse. Remember Lot's wife. Where was Lot's wife? Where was her heart? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom. The angel come. Listen, God can't destroy this wicked city until the righteous are gone. Lot and his wife, his daughters, the, boy, the, the husband stayed back. They enjoyed their sin. God brought them out. And as they're going out, she looked back. She still longed for Sodom. What happened to her? She was turned into a pillar of salt. God said, don't even look back. Run when destruction is coming. It was all a heart issue. We regard iniquity in our heart. Don't pray. Stop. The Lord's not hearing your prayers. Not that he's not hearing them. He's just not, he's not answering them. He's not, he's not entertaining our prayers. If we have sin in our lives, that's hidden away. Hidden away. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Prophet Isaiah says, Your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God. Another translation of the New King James says it this way, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your iniquities have built barriers <coughs> between you and your God. And your sins have made Him hide His face from you so that He does not listen. Think about that. If we're living in active sin, or iniquity, he talks talk about iniquity, sin... It's building a bar- Think about it. Who wants a barrier between us and God, our relationship? You're not saying it's separating that, 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 that kind of a relationship. Because remember, Israel was what? Was the apple of God's eye. It was his people. He loved them. But it was building barriers between them, him, between them and God. Separating them, so to speak. That's, that's what that word means to be built. I don't mean it's like it's cutting them off. It's just building a barrier. And the more that we live in sin, it could be all these things we're talking about, seeking comfort, stuff, self, religious activity, whatever we're building in our lives. If that stuff isn't, isn't built in the Lord, we begin to put up another block in these barriers. And it's a, it talks about a, it's a fellowship issue, really, and it's a blessings issue. He just simply does not listen to us until those things are made right. Like I said, it all comes through then confession and repentance. You know, when you look at the, the nation of Israel, when I say that, I'm saying... The two kingdoms, if you understand how the stuff broke down, Israel and Judah, but the nation of Israel, all God wanted them to do was to re- confess and repent. And he would send prophet after prophet after prophet to warn them. But what happened to all the prophets? Yeah, they got killed. They laughed at the prophets. Well, no, preach to us peace and safety. Preach to us prosperity. And they kept coming and coming and talking. You know, and just over many years, God was very gracious. All he wanted was confession and repentance. And they refused to do it, and God brought judgment. Because the sin that was in their life, the barriers that they were building up between them and God. So if you're in James chapter 4, <clears throat> we're going to look at this section. Well, we're talking about having a hunger and thirst for God. And the second question is, what are those things that can, can hinder us or get in the way to that deeper walk, to having a true hunger for Him? And so we talked about the first couple. We're talking about sin. James chapter 4, I'm going to start at the end of verse 2. Because before we get down through this, we need to identify who James is talking to. So maybe the ladies' group will help us on, in this study. I think I know who he's talking to. I don't agree with some Bible commentators on James. I'm going to be honest with you. And if I said a couple of the names, you would know who I was talking about. I totally disagree. Totally, so I'm just going to tell you where I'm at. James says that, or that some of these famous, pretty popular Bible commentators are, say that James is talking to unbelievers. Unbelievers. False. He's not. Go back to James 1, 1, and 1, 2. See who he's talking to. But 
starting here in James 4, and now I'm, gonna, I'm reading this in more of a, the paraphrase version. So if you're in like the ESV or NASB, New King James, or something more, more of a literal translation, it may sound a little different, <clears throat> but it's the same. James 4, starting at the end of 2, it says you. He says you don't have what you want. Listen to a lot of the yous. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Verse 3, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. He says you want only what you, uh, will give you pleasure. So who's these yous he's talking to? This is not my cousin Vinny, the judge, you. Use, use. Sorry, that's nothing biblical at all. <clears throat> Who's the you? You don't have because you want, you don't have what you, you want because you don't ask God for it. Who's this you? It, it, does it sound like he's talking to unbelievers? Yeah, go back to James 1 1, 1 2. He's talking to believers, mostly Jewish believers, but he's talking to believers. Some people will say, as we're going to get down into verse 8, Oh my goodness, he couldn't be talking about Christians because this is too tough. He's context, remember, context when we study the Bible. Context. You don't have what you want because you don't ask for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. He says, you want only what will give you pleasure. So here are folks praying for its stuff, comfort, and self. You adulterers. That's why a lot of folks don't like James because the Holy Spirit is very in your face. There's times I don't even like to, like James. Like, dude, you're kind of tough. Who's talking here James in James 2.4? 4, or 4.2? 4, 4.4, 4, I'm sorry. Who's talking? You adulterers. God. God. Remember, all Scripture given by inspiration of God. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through James. God is saying, you adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world, friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, just to, for repeat sake. I say it one more time. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Is that an ouch statement? I'm just, don't be mad at me, I'm just the messenger. I didn't write it, take it up with the author. <clears throat> what he's saying is that if we have this love, what, no, let's, let's go back up. What's the world that he's talking about? If you, if you love the world, you make yourself, some translations will say at enmity, E-N-M-I-T-Y. It's the same word, enmity, or an enemy of God. What's the world? <clears throat> the systems of the world? We know that God created all things. We see the trees and the oceans and the st all this stuff we see in the world. I mean, that's God created and he called it good. This is God's, what's, what's he talking about? The world. Culture. What's that? <clears throat> culture, society, anything that opposes God. Don't we live in a land today that opposes God? That's why you need to be here on Tuesday night and listen to this message. Tough message. Something's coming. We live in a nation that at one point was blessed, I believe. But now the nation's starting to turn. And what's happening? The church now is being influenced. The world's creeping into the church. So Rich says, sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between a church person and a non-church person. Red flag. Read, read the prayer in John chapter 17. There's got to be a separation. You know, I've talked to some people, <clears throat> when, when church people, when, when I, I hate using that term, like when, when the real disciples of Jesus Christ start taking their walk seriously with the Lord and they become really truly hungry and thirst, thirsting for God, you will look weird in and amongst church people. You'll look crazy in front of the world. But there's sometimes, even if you start hungering for God, you have a deeper knowledge, you, you have this, this, this deeper longing for more of the things of the Lord. Everything else is just getting so, and, you, and your focus is the Lord. That's what your pursuit's going to be. You may even look weird in your own home as a radical. Well, you take that Jesus thing way too seriously. <clears throat> Jesus is calling full time disciples, not part time ones. Full time, full time disciples. If we love the world, we make ourselves an enemy of God. It's plain language. Verse 5. What do you think that the Scripture means when they say, when it, when they say that the Spirit, God has, the Spirit God has placed within us is filled with envy? God wants us. God, but He gives us even more grace, thank God, <laughs> to stand against 
such evil desires. So these desires, what he's talking about is this love for the world. Or you're praying because you want more of the world's stuff. I want more, I want more, I want more. I've got to have more. And, and he says, stop praying, you're not going to get it because all you want it is for your own pleasure. That's all you stop. It's beginning to expose something on the inside. But we, get, but we get more grace to stand against these desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but favors the humble. It gives more grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How is the devil <clears throat> the enemy of our soul? How is he part of this whole loving the world? What's that? So he's the, he's the ruler of this, the uh, Bible says the prince of the power, the heir, the, the, the temporary ruler of this world. <clears throat> He'll come as an angel of light, disguising himself as an angel of light, the Bible says. Paul says that to the church in Corinth. Um, he has ministers of righteousness. They're people that he uses to entice. He's always the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. First John 2, another reason to be part of that study. I'm just going to keep giving you advertisements. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you understand sports, you know, remember when Bill Belichick got in trouble for stealing the opposing team's plays a couple years ago in football? We don't need to steal them because they're just right there in the Bible for the, the enemy's schemes. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's how he gets us. Go back to Genesis 3. Isn't that exactly how he got Eve? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. She saw that the fruit was good. I could be wise. I thought it was good for the eating. My flesh. Same thing what Mike brought up. Isn't it the very same that the Satan did to Jesus? You can turn the stone into bread. Oh, my body. Worship me, pride of life. I can give you the kingdoms of the world. Jesus didn't say, wait a second, they're mine. He didn't say that. For a season, for a temporary season, Satan has control of the kingdoms of the world. He'll offer those things. Everything that opposes the gospel. I think I saw a hand. And that's why it is important to know the Bible and to know it in context. You know, I mean, and there's all these programs and methods and things that we can use. And I think some of the stuff's all right, but, you know, and it's called the inductive Bible study program. Like when you study the Bible, and that's how I always read the Bible, you know, it's, it's called observe, interpret, apply. If you remember those three things, we go to Nicaragua and teach the pastors down there, teach these pastors on how to, uh, to know the Bible, to work out the Bible, and to know how to t correctly teach their people. You observe the passage. You just read it over and over again. You're not looking to try to interpret it. You just read it. You know, who's talking? Who's he talking to? Or, being, or who, what, what's being talked about? And then you begin to just kind of just dig into it, begin to interpret what's actually being said, and then you always have to make application. How do I live this out? How do I live? That's how you study the Bible. That's why when, like, when I go into James 4, that's kind of why I did that. Who's the you? Who's, take some time to figure it out. Who's he talking to? You know, and I, so I don't agree with a couple pretty famous Bible commentators when they start saying that, especially now when we get into verse 8, that he surely can't be talking to Christians. So now they're talking to the unbelievers. It doesn't even make any sense. When you read it, I'm, just, I'm simple like that, so whatever. So humble yourselves. Resist the devil, and he will flee to you. It's all about humility. We have to live a life of humility. Now listen to verse 8. Come, some of your translations will say, draw close to God and he'll draw close to you. Or come close to God and God will come close to you. So how is this going to happen? Here we go. Wash your hands, you sinners. What, what other trans... Um, I don't know if anybody's got more of a literal. Wash your hands, you what? If you guys are reading. There's another word before sinners, probably. You, sinners, is there anything else? Ye filthy, some translations will say filthy. Wash you, your hands, you filthy sinners. But Lord, tough words. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Your loyalty is divided between God 
in the world. So how do we draw close to God and then God will draw close to us? Is it developing this hunger and thirst for him? Number one, we wash our hands. Now the Jews would have understood that ceremonial cleaning. They'd have understood what that meant. For us, it's just simply what? It's the flesh. It's the outwardness of who we are. Galatians 5, the lust of the flesh are evident. All kind, and he lists all kinds of stuff out there. A lot of it's sexual sin. There's other things that he talks about, being a thief. Washing our hands from that stuff. Then it says purifying our heart, being pure of heart. It's going back to that whole Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. My heart now is right before the Lord. I mean, would you be willing to just give God your, that inner thoughts the inner, and just say, Lord, examine this? Who would be willing to do that one? Because sometimes we have the most vile thoughts when we sit in the church. We, we look holy as we sit here, and we're like, you know, doing our, get a Bible, but all of a sudden the mind gets, goes crazy. What's in the inside? We purify our hearts. Matter of fact, uh, what's that? <clears throat> Psalm 139, Clark Robinson has brought that up, you know, that we honestly go before the Lord and say, you know what, examine my heart. Is there any wicked way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting? When we, when we, when we honestly, with, with great sincerity, say to the Lord, man, Lord, would you examine me deep in me? And you mean it? Imagine what's going to come out. I think I was talking to Will and Mandy. You think detox is crazy? What kind of, what's going to come out whenever the Lord starts to add the fire to the life and the dross becomes up and starts, oh man, Lord, I didn't know that was in there. <laughs> He'll show you some stuff. And it's always to lead us in the way of ever. We're to have pure hearts. Another First John chapter 3, we're to live pure as he is pure. The, the standard by which we measure ourselves is the life of Christ. Purify yourself just as he is pure, First John 3, 3. That's the standard. Because our loyalty now is divided between God and the world. We'll be honest this morning and say that at times your loyalty is divided. You've got one foot in the kingdom and you've got one foot in the world. Got one foot wanting to pursue the things of the Lord, but also, oh, look at that new car. There's nothing wrong with having new cars. I'm going after the promotion at my job. I, I don't have time for Bible reading. I got this going on. I'll get to you, Lord. And what happens over time, you become the church of Ephesus. You do some ministry, you do some stuff, but Christ is no longer our first love. We've got to be so careful. And James is calling us on it. And then he goes on and talks about some other things that should be in our life there in verse 9. Let there be tears for what you have done. Have you ever cried over your sin? I'm not asking anybody to answer, but have you just answer within your heart. Have you ever truly cried with serious tears over your own sin? Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. And then verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. I mean, we've brought this story up here before, but Luke 18, remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? I think this, this, this sums up those two people. Go into Luke 18 and read it. This, the story of the Pharisee, the very religious man, and this sinner, this tax collector, this publican. They both come to the temple. The one that says, oh, I pray thus with myself, and look at all I do. I do all this religious activity. I'm just paraphrasing it. I do all this stuff. I tithe. I do good. I Outwardly, I, I mean, look at all I wear, these religious garb, and I look so religious, and I act so religious, and people respect me. Then it says the sinner, the publican, this tax collector, wouldn't even dare as to lift his eyes to heaven. And he smote his chest in sorrow, <clears throat> deep grief, brokenness, and God, have mercy on me, a sinner. See, he knew who God was and who he was. I'm a sinner in your presence. And Jesus said, which of these two men went home justified? Jesus said this. Which of these two men went home justified? The religious man who's claiming to serve me, or this despised traitor of a Jew that's taken money for Rome? Which one went home justified? The tax collector. Now, I've heard people say, you know what, we're going to be surprised one day who's in heaven and who's not. We're going to be surprised one day who's in heaven and who's not. <clears throat> so I know it's getting kind of late. I'm going to jump down just through a couple things. <clears throat> There's a question, so what's the remedy of these things that can hinder us? Especially, we're talking about sin. We're talking about the other things, too. They, kind of, they go hand in hand. To have a true hunger and thirst for God. Well, now, in this James 4 section, we saw a lot of it. 
We have to humble ourselves. We have to resist the enemy. We have to draw close to God. We, there's got to be confession and repentance in our lives. There's got to be sorrow in our lives, a humility in our lives. When God shows us some things, Hebrews chapter 12 is, and we're going to kind of just roll through these pretty quick. If you want to write them down, I'd encourage you to study them out. But what's the remedy <clears throat> to making sure that we're not having kind of a, a, a block or these, these, these things that can sometimes happen between us and God, uh, a relationship between us and God? What's the remedy? Hebrews 12, parts of 1 and 2. <clears throat> it says, let us lay aside every weight. And I've added some other things in there. That's, and it also says, or the, well, lay aside anything that actually slows us down, or let us lay aside <coughs> every weight and the sin. So there's two things here. Let us lay aside every weight that slows us down, or weight, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, or the sin that so clings to us closely, or so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, or the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us lay aside every weight. What's the difference between weight and sin? Because there's two things he's talking about here. Let us lay aside every weight or that which slows us down and the sin which so easily clings to us or ensnares us. So we, we've been talking about sin. We, sin is just simply missing the mark. It's living contrary to God's standard. Matter of fact, James will go on and say in James 4.17 that if we know to do good but don't do it, it's sin to us. So that means if you know the speed limit on 81.65 and you purpose to do 80 as crazy as it sounds, you're committing sin. Because you know what to do is the right thing to do. I mean, look at James 4.17. What's the difference between sin and the weight that so easily ensnares us? <clears throat> Who would agree with that? Sin weighs us down. And... It's like, almost like you're trying to run this weight race with a ball and chain. <laughs> so, Phil, how well would you run the 50K the JFK 50K with, um, with dress shoes on. New dress shoes, leather. <laughs> Slick bottom. You're not going to do very well. I mean, isn't it, it weighs us down. Some people believe that there's a separation there and say that this, this weighting down isn't actually sin. It's just the things of life. It's not, I mean, who knows that having a new car is not sinful? It's not sinful. But if it puts you in debt and it enslaves you to something, or, like, there's, there's a lots of things, even in our country, that's not what you would call sinful. But who knows there's a lots of things in our country that will weigh you down. Weigh you down. Relationships can weigh you down. Not any marriage relationships, I'm just saying, relationships. Where's Anita at? Oh, yeah, you said that with confidence, because she's in the back room. <clears throat> No, yeah, sometimes even relationships, if they're not ordained by God, if God's not brought them, they, 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 or even sometimes they, if the focus, remember Jesus said to be a true disciple, Luke 14, you are going to hate who? Mother, father, re, kids, all relationships. In comparison to your love for me, you're going to even hate your own life. And he says, and if you don't, you cannot be my disciple. What? You've got to love him. That's what we're talking about, having a hunger and thirst for God. He is the greatest pursuit, even over my husband, my wife, my kids, my grandkids. Christ is the focus and the center. And when that happens, you then develop this hunger and thirst. So we lay aside all this extra stuff. It may not be sin, it's just weighty stuff. And the sin. And we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Psalm 101 and verse 3 says this, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the works of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. So what do you set before your eyes? Have you ever done that? Well, I can look at this for a second. I got control. And the next thing you know, you end up in some crazy where place. I will, and that's a purpose. I will set nothing before my eyes. I'm not going to allow it to cling to me. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 says this. How can a young man keep his way pure? And we're to live pure lives by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word or treasured your word or hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So what's the remedy for this stuff? Based on what the psalmist says there. <clears throat> God's word. Knowing God's word. 
How does a young man say pure? By taking heed, by obeying, by guarding your heart according to his word. And so as you begin to spend time in God's word, you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that's offensive to the Lord. It still doesn't give us a reason not to know the word. We can say, well, I'm just not going to read it because I don't want to come across anything that I might have to repent of. God still is going to hold us accountable because then you just don't have a love for his word. <clears throat> hey, Mason, jump all the way down to James 5, and we'll end with this one. James 5, the last, the last slide, or verse anyways. <clears throat> James tells us this. I don't know, are you guys in this verse today? I don't know where, you, where the ladies are. I know they're getting ready to conclude James, study of James. James 5, 16. <clears throat> Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Wait a second. You, could, might, you might be saying, like, well, I thought we were supposed to confess our sins to the Lord, 1 John 1, 9. Yes. <clears throat> You're dead. Neat. She's here. He, threw, he, he, he tried to throw you under the bus. <clears throat> Sorry, that's Jim's wife. If anybody doesn't know, that's Anita that he was just talking about. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. How, how is that possible? Any help on that verse? Confess your sins to one another. <clears throat> Listen, I can't forgive Rich's sins. I have no ability to do it. Because he hasn't really sinned against his sin. I mean, maybe, I mean, there's times that that happens where we do that, but just the sin in general. He, what, what do you think he means by that? Remember, he's talking to a collection of believers at church, or he talks about the 12 tribes of Israel, but believers. Confess your sins to each other, to each other, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. And, and the, the, the prayer of a righteous person produces great results. Why is that so important? It actually takes great humility to even do that. And trust. Listen, God's the only one that forgives sins. God's the only one that can forgive sin. That's who we've committed our sins against. But there's something about the way that as a, as a body of believers, when you develop that kind of trust and family um, atmosphere, and, and, um, and there's got to be humility, obviously, in that, especially when, it, I mean, there's a lot of things that I think a lot of Christians struggle with. That they're, they're just they're too ashamed to even mention it in, in, out loud. That should never be the case with a body of believers, ever. You should be able to confess your sins more, more openly and with greater trust to a body of true believers than you should to a counselor or whomever. <clears throat> because this is the only place where there's going to be healing. Be healed from the stuff. And see, sin is huge because sin plays, that third point we've been looking at, this unrepentant sin plays into the other things because a pursuit of stuff and comfort and self is still sin. Making ministry, um, doing ministry over Christ is still sin. Sin's a big issue. It's still in the life of, the, of a believer. We still struggle with it at times. Confess your sins to each other. I would encourage people in here, if you're, if you're struggling with something, I'm sure that probably even during this morning that there's things that even came to your mind. God maybe starts showing some things in your heart that maybe even your spouse that they don't know about or who at some other you just don't, they don't know you're, you're struggling with something and you know that it's not pleasing to the Lord <clears throat> the Lord is calling his church today and I'm talking in a greater in a greater way than just the storehouse here the, the, the Lord is calling his church today collectively to a, a, a sense of repentance I think that Christ is so close to coming back it's Read, read uh, 2 Peter 3, who he's coming back for. He's coming back for people that are, that are walking in spotlessness and they're blameless or without blemish. Pure lives. Walking in holiness. Walking in holiness. That means we don't have hidden sin. doesn't mean that we're not going to. But we're willing to openly share it with our brothers and sisters in humility and tears and brokenness and say, you know what, I know this isn't pleasing to the Lord. And... And I don't want to be that kind of a Christian, that kind of a, a disciple when he comes back, that he's going to call, catch me, whatever your issue is, struggle is. So I'd encourage you, maybe today, if you feel like you can trust folks, man, is, is to open up outside of your family to another brother, another sister within the church, 
So, you know, I struggle with this, and I want to be used in a, in a powerful way in these days that we live in. I want to have a greater hunger and thirst for Him. I don't want there to be a hindrance between me and Him. I want to know Christ in a deeper way. I want to walk with Him in faithfulness, just like what Wilkerson was talking about. We know the world's spinning out of control. The church is in a bad, is in bad shape collectively. God's reshaping and redoing things, and He's looking for folks that are just going to take their walk with Him seriously, to really hunger and thirst for Him day by day, growing in Him and being on guard against worldliness and stuff and even ministry. Let's pray. 